Good afternoon and uh, welcome to the first ever CE Entrepreneurial Impact Competition. Uh, when we were planning this event uh, over the last several months and weeks, we never imagined that the first uh, NCAA men's uh, basketball appearance would be scheduled for the same time. So those of you that are basketball lovers, I, I hope that you can watch it on the internet or record it for, for viewing later. And thank you for joining us uh, this afternoon. Here in the School of Civil and Environmental Engineering, we are constantly amazed by the creative problem solving and innovative ideas displayed by our students. We hope this very first competition will help you to boost the entrepreneurial mindset in our school and help launch the innovative uh, ideas of our students and community. This competition began as an open call for, 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 excuse me, for proposals during the fall of 2020 semester individuals and teams of students at both the undergraduate and graduate level applied their CE knowledge and skills to develop entrepreneurial ideas that can improve the human condition. Proposals for the competition were due last December. Following a thorough review from our panel of judges, four finalists were announced just a month ago at the Hyatt Distinguished Leadership Lecture. Tonight, two teams will be selected as the winners, and each will take home a $5,000 prize sponsored by our generous donors, Bill and Elizabeth Higginbotham and Greg Zietlin in honor of his parents. The, the four finalists are with us today and they will be presenting their proposals to you, our live audience and our distinguished panel of judges. Please join me in a special welcome to our four finalists. They are BioBuilt, will be presented by John Gutun, uh, Colchira, will be presented by Eli Berger, Abby Cohen, Thomas Ago, and Elliot Reed. Voltopure will be presented by Nassim Gore Datar, uh, Mo Jaren, and Jin Fang Zhou. River Recon will be presented by Matthew Falcone, Aaron Kolowski, Tim Purvis, and Kaylin uh, Sinoscali. Over the next hour, each team will pitch their idea to our panel of judges and then make and then take questions. Ten minutes will be allotted for the judges to ask questions. We welcome your questions from the audience as well using the Q&A box at the bottom right of your screen. Each team will have an opportunity to respond to the audience questions during the break for the judges' deliberation. With that, I will now turn it over to Professor John Taylor, our Associate Chair for Graduate Programs and Research Innovation, who will be our MC for today's event. All yours, Jacob. Great, thank you, Don. Thank you for that uh, introduction. Uh, I'd like to start off by introducing you all to the excellent panel of judges who have agreed to participate in this uh, event. Uh, maybe judges, as I introduce you, you can, you can turn on your, your video briefly. Uh, first, Dr. Lisa Rosenstein, a director of the Charles E. Gearing Program in Engineering Communications in the School of Civil and Environmental Engineering. Uh, as director of the Engineering Communications Program in uh, Civil and Environmental Engineering, Dr. Lisa Rosenstein brings her expertise in written, visual, and oral communication to the judging panel. Welcome, Lisa. Uh, next, uh, we have KP Reddy. KP received his degree in civil engineering in 1994 from Georgia Tech. KP is a civil engineer, an entrepreneur, and an investor. Uh, he's globally recognized authority in the built environment, artificial intelligence, robotics, automation, collaborative communication, mobile applications, and cloud computing. Over more than 25 years, he's been a technologist, subject matter expert, a founder, a CEO, an advisor, an investor, a professor, an author, and a coach, and I guess now a judge. Uh, welcome, KP, uh, to the judging panel. Uh, next up, we have Dr. J. David Frost, the Elizabeth and Bill Higginbotham Professor in the School of Civil and Environmental Engineering. Uh, that professorship should sound familiar today, Higginbotham. Uh, uh, Dr. Frost has a range of startup experience involving university campuses, academic programs, and technology companies. He's been a founding partner in two software companies that leverage mobile, web and cloud-based applications to acquire and manage engineering data. Welcome, David. And next we have Kendell Renee Kelly. Uh, Kendell received her degree in civil engineering from Georgia Tech in 2001. 
Uh, Kendall is a lifestyle lawyer uh, and strategist specializing in the intellectual property, business, sports, and entertainment industries. Her practice focuses on counseling private and corporate clients in setup, protection, strategic planning, monetization, and liquidation of intellectual property assets. Welcome, Kendall. I think we can uh, understand why you would bring something to the judging panel. Uh, thank you very much for participating. Uh, and then uh, the fifth judge is uh, Dr. Leonidas Emenegger. Uh, Dr. Emenegger is a fall graduate of the PhD program in civil engineering, just this most recent fall. Uh, and he has a certificate in engineering entrepreneurship. As an inventor on a patent, he brings experience in intellectual property development and commercialization. Welcome, Leo. That's our panel of judges. I want to thank all of the judges for joining us this evening. Now, without any further ado, let's get started with the actual presentations. We have uh, four teams, as Dr. Webster described. Each team is going to have five minutes to present their proposal. Uh, the presentations will be assessed by our panel of judges on how well they satisfy five criteria. First is innovation. Is the idea novel? How does it compare to other ideas that address the same problem? Second, demand. Is there a demand for this invention? Are people likely to use it? Third, impact. How big is the potential impact of this invention? For example, how many people or communities are likely to actually use it? Fourth, inventor passion. How passionate is the inventor about, uh, sorry, the inventor or the team about the idea? And finally, fifth, the probability of becoming a successful endeavor. Uh, would someone actually invest in helping make this invention a reality? So let's get started. First, we have BioBuilt, uh, inspired by the architecture and load transfer efficiency of plant roots. This ground anchor features an expansive root mechanism that resists pullout loads more efficiently than conventional ground anchors. BioBuilt is being presented by John Huntoon, John, you may begin your presentation. Thank you, Dr. Taylor. Uh, are you seeing uh, the screen right now? Yes. Perfect. Uh, so hello, everyone. Uh, my name is John Huntoon. I'm here to discuss my venture, BioBuilt Ground Anchors. Uh, and in order to understand the purpose of the venture, I think it's important for us to take a step back and consider the current situation of the construction industry as a whole. We're at this point in time where the demand for civil infrastructure is very high and it's only increasing, right? Populations are growing, uh, cities are developing more and more and our infrastructure is aging. All this adds up to an ever increasing demand for material resources. And in the past, uh, many civil engineering challenges could be tackled just by using more concrete and more steel. But as our resources grow more scarce and exploiting those resources becomes more harmful to the environment, uh, we need to adopt more efficient solutions to our infrastructure problems. That's where BioBuilt comes in. Uh, BioBuilt Ground Anchors is applying a very successful design technique. It's known as bio-inspired design. Develop an ultra-efficient ground anchor. You may ask, what is a ground anchor? Well, ground anchor is just any structure that resists an applied load that's attempting to pull that structure out of the ground. Uh, you might not have seen or heard of these, but they're actually very common. These are a component of retaining walls, building foundations, uh, wind turbines, all sorts of things. Um, and what BioBuilt has done is incorporated the highly efficient anchoring properties of fibrous plant roots into our flagship product, the root-inspired ground anchor, or RIGA for short. Uh, with a more efficient anchor geometry, the RIGA can be much smaller than the conventional anchors in use today. A shorter, smaller anchor uses much less concrete and steel in the design, and it can be installed much more quickly. Uh, together, these save uh, valuable material resources, uh, and it can also improve the productivity of the contractors who install ground anchors. Uh, there's actually also quite a bit of design redundancy built into the Riga. For example, if the anchor uh, doesn't open all the way underground, it would still provide a significant capacity increase to what's offered by a conventional anchor. In a lot of cases, we can actually see using these anchors to avoid drilling into difficult or problematic materials like uh, hard rocks or caving soils. Uh, and all that's, you know, all that's great, but what makes this a, a successful venture? Right? Well, in order for the root-inspired ground anchor to succeed as a product, uh, it has to be a more cost-effective solution for contractors who install ground anchors. 
These are our customers. So to be a more cost-effective solution, two things need to be true. Uh, number one, the Riga has to reduce the amount of time it takes contractors to install ground anchors. Uh, I've talked to vice presidents from multiple different contractors, and I know from my own experience in the industry that how fast a contractor can install ground anchors is the single most important performance metric for these companies. The second thing that needs to be true is that BioBuilt needs to offer the Riga at a price that's comparable with conventional ground anchors. If two products are similar in price and just as reliable, but one can be installed much more easily, choosing that product is obviously a net benefit for the contractor. Now, because of all the material uh, saved in using the more efficient anchoring geometry, the Riga can be sold at the exact same price as conventional anchors with a significant margin left over for BioBuilt. You might not um, you know, realize it, but there's actually more than a million ground anchors installed every year just in the US. That's a $124 million market, and the size of that market is growing. Uh, there are actually relatively few players in the space, and most of the marketing is interpersonal. So because of that, BioBuilt should be able to capture 10% of that market in just eight years, with 20% in 15 or more. And uh, ultimately, the operation will expand globally. At this kind of scale, um, we're talking about saving millions of tons of raw materials every year. Uh, and now the civil engineering world, it can be slow to adopt new technologies, but once new strategies catch on, contractors really don't have a choice but to follow suit and choose the most optimal solution for every project. And often that solution is gonna be a Riga. More than just having a technological advantage with the root-inspired ground anchor, BioBuilt also has several advantages as a venture. Georgia Tech is filing an international patent application at the moment for the Riga, and BioBuilt will license that once it becomes available. Uh, that means that the Riga will be patent protected in every market that BioBuilt chooses to pursue. The project is also NSF funded through the CVBG, which is the Center for Biomediated and Bioinspired Geotechnics. Through the center, the project has already secured the funding that it needs to be developed into a commercially viable technology. BioBuilt is a terrific chance for any angel investor to reap the rewards of a bio-inspired innovation and invest in a company that's actually gonna conserve the world's resources while it improves our infrastructure. Thank you for your time. I, I know there'll be a lot of presentations today, but please remember BioBuilt Ground Anchors. Uh, I'd be happy to take any questions. Thank you very much, John, for that excellent uh, presentation and sharing the roots of your venture with us. Um, we're going to move to <laughs> we're going to move to the questions from the judges. I do want to remind, first of all, uh, remind people that they can post their questions in the Q and A. The uh, the participants um, who are out there in the audience, and we will discuss those uh, with the teams when the judges go into their deliberation. Um, first, I'd like to ask Dr. Lisa, Lisa Rosenstein if she has a question for the team, but let me make a note that um, we will not be uh, asking uh, Dr. Frost for a question because he has a conflict of interest. He is John Huntoon's uh, uh, PhD advisor. Lisa? I had a, a simple question. That you, you say that your design geometry will save raw materials uh, that are currently used for ground anchors. I'm wondering if you have any plans to use of different materials than are currently in use? Oh, that's a really good question. Um, part of the design of the, of the anchor itself is to use the most cost-effective materials. So um, right now that's steel, that's cement. Uh, in the future, with um, a slight tweak to how the anchor is installed, you may not have the need for cement. So that would be um, a bit of an improvement to the materials that are used for the anchor. But um, just to make the product viable and for the company to get going, the plan is to use concrete and steel, conventional, commonly available materials. Thank you very much. Thank you, Lisa. KP, do you have a question for John? Yeah, um, so we know our industry is slow adopters, right? So um, any, there's a, a, a tendency to go to the, the old and proven, and we've been doing this for 30 years, son, kind of conversations. Um, how do you plan on educating not just the, the contractor community, but also the design community, the engineers that would be kind of an influencer on adoption of the technology? So how, what's your go-to-market and how you think about you can accelerate 
the education, you know, educating the market on a new product. So, right. I think that's kind of a two phase thing. So the, the first phase is us through the CBBG, through that work, um, doing the research to make the, uh, the engineering side comfortable with using the technology. And then after that's complete, which I feel like that's the first phase, I actually plan to go out into the field um, with contractors if possible and demonstrate the installation, which I, I feel is very, uh, it's, it's intuitive once you see it happen. And I think contractors are smart enough and they know their industry that they're gonna realize that this is, this is a good thing, it's a benefit for contractors uh, when, they just, when they see that in person. So I really wanna build those personal relationships and I think that's where the trust is going to come from. So you, you think it's a direct go-to-market versus a channel strategy to maybe somebody that's already in, you know, in this space, right, versus, you know, go, go partner with Tensar or somebody and let them help you go to market. You think it's a direct selling approach? I think a direct selling approach is better. Um, and the reason I think that is just because uh, – this product is more likely going to cannibalize some of the sales of a lot of the companies who I would go to for help um, mm -hmm. because it's it's reducing basically the quantity of ground anchor that you're selling. So it's it's unlikely, in my estimation, that a company would, would choose to pursue something that's unproven like this um, in place of its existing successful business strategy. Okay, one last question. If you're highly successful, how do you exit? Uh, how do you exit? You you probably um, build it to a point where you can uh, find a more established company that be that recognizes you know, the usefulness of the product and is willing to, to take over a portion of your equity uh, to let you move on to, to bigger and, and even better things. All right, great, thanks. Okay, John, you're, you can't exit yet. We still have some more questions for you. Uh, Kendall, uh, do you have some questions for John? KP took a, a big chunk of what I was going to ask, um, but my question is, is in that same workforce vein, what does the learning curve look like for um, what is the other big line item for civil engineering products, which is that workforce item? Uh, do, do you mean... Do, do you have a learning on the... Do, do you mean like the, uh, the uptake of the product? Yeah, absolutely. Oh, yeah. Um, so that's that's already something that's baked into my assumptions about the company growth. So I think initially it, it could take one or even two years to get a company comfortable enough to use this on an actual project. But once you get one company, there's sort of a snowballing effect, right? Now that company is comfortable using it, they start using it more and more. And because this is really kind of a small world, it's uh, everybody knows each other. So the, the word can spread fairly quickly in that way. And then um, once uh, you know a contractor chooses to use the Riga, they're going to win all their contracts, and other contractors are going to have to follow suit and have to become comfortable with it. Did I answer the question? Okay. Yeah. Yep. Thank you. Yeah. All right. Thanks, Kendall. Um, uh, Leo, do you have a question for John? Yeah, I think, uh, I think a lot of the other judges have hit on this, but I'll ask more directly. So, you know, when I see a product like this, I think of the risks, and I wanted to ask directly, who assumes the risk when they would, say, use this product? Would the contractor assume the risk? And uh, are there any barriers to adoption in codes or any other legal uh, problems with this sort of product? And has there been any large-scale experimentation? Has there, Have you ever built, like, an MSC wall with this? Um, that might... Uh, help with that, or maybe a test uh, wall that, say, GDOT built or some other organization? So one of the great things about this kind of product and these kind of contractors who would use it are that a lot of these contractors work on a design-build basis where the contractor takes on the risk and also benefits from the reward. So there isn't a, a, an external third party in every case that needs to mandate the use of this anchor and then the contractor installs it. The contractor is actually free to choose um, a product that they think is going to help them get a job or help them maximize their profits in some way. Um, so that that's the contractor is getting both the risk and the reward of using it. And uh, as of right now, we haven't used this on any real walls, but that is something that we plan to do in the future through the CBB. All right, thanks. Yeah.
All right, thanks, uh, Leo. Thanks all the judges. I'd like to just uh, reiterate Dr. Frost has recused himself from uh, evaluation of this particular team, um, which means John would get one fewer question unless a judge would like to ask another question. Two. They weren't expecting that. Okay. Um, do you have any questions, Dr. Taylor? I do, but Leo took it. Um, uh, the the idea of testing it out. So, um, do you have a specific plan to 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 prototype and test this out at any scale? Uh, yes, we're doing a lab chamber tests in the next couple months, and then uh, once we demonstrate that those are successful, we'll start moving out into the field. The uh, CBBG has a outdoor test bed in Arizona that uh, we have good access to, and we're going to be using that in the future. Great. Well, thank you very much, John. Good luck with the venture. Good luck today. Um, we appreciate your presentation. Um, thank you very much. You may only hear my clapping, but I'm sure I'm joined by 50 other people. Um, next up is Culturia. Uh, Culturia's system uh, for online excuse me, on-site wastewater treatment and resource recovery enable a more circular approach to water and nutrient management. Uh, Culturia is presented by Abby Cohen. Uh, Abby, you may begin your presentation whenever you're ready. Hi. Thank you, Dr. Taylor. Can you see me and hear me? Yes. Okay, great. And we see your presentation as well. Okay, great. Um, so thank you very much. <laughs> uh, so we're Culturia, and like many of you, we're highly motivated to improve the environment around us. And you might be familiar with the term peak oil, but another critical concern for us is peak phosphorus. So some scientists estimate that we'll be reaching peak, peak phosphorus supply by 2030 to 2070. Now, phosphorus is a critical component of fertilizer, without which we won't be able to grow enough food to feed the population. The phosphorus fertilizer market has also experienced tremendous volatility in recent years, at times achieving or reaching cost spikes of up to 800%. But this isn't just a supply issue, it's also a management issue. It turns out that our mismanagement of phosphorus and fertilizer resources is over-fertilizing waterways downstream, and it's resulted in a, a dead zone in the Gulf of Mexico that spans over 17,000 square kilometers because of this mismanagement in our wastewater resources and agriculture nutrient management. But rather than be discouraged by all of this news, we prefer to see the market opportunity. So in the wastewater market, it turns out that water and wastewater um, reached a market size in 2018 of over $695 billion, and it's experiencing significant growth. Um, over the last several years, the municipal and industrial wastewater segments have been growing at uh, about six and a half to seven and a half compound annual growth rate. But meanwhile, the annual increase in treatment costs for wastewater producers has been growing at a rate that's double um, the inflation rate. On the nutrient side, we see a huge opportunity in the nutrient recovery market. Turns out the nutrient recovery market is experiencing tremendous growth as well, with a compound annual growth rate over 20% through 2022. And we expect this to actually increase in coming years as we reach those peak phosphorus levels. Meanwhile, investment in early stage ag tech startups in 2017 topped $10 billion. So we see a huge opportunity to link this water and ag tech market. But perhaps the most exciting market for us is the food and beverage market. It turns out that brewing a liter of beer uses five liters of fresh water to produce. So there's a huge opportunity there for increased efficiency and technologies to lessen water load. The food and beverage spending on structures and equipment in 2017 topped $26 billion, which means that the industry is growing and it's investing in its structures and equipment, um, adding over 7,000 facilities between 2014 and 2018, which is over six times the next largest industry's uh, facilities growth. 
So we see the potential impact for uh, improved water treatment technologies. And so our go-to-market strategy is to target breweries and wineries where we can reduce BOD by more than 90%, reduce water treatment energy use by 60%, lower water treatment operating costs by 50%, and reduce sludge production in this industry by 30 to 40%. But perhaps the most exciting part of the, the brewery and winery industry for us is that nutrient recovery opportunity to reinvest nutrients um, yielded through our waste treatment process to, to um, reinvest the nutrients in the growth of hops and grapes. So Culturia will produce advanced water treatment options that produce high quality reuse water. Our systems will be modular and tunable provide fit for purpose, scalable, and customized treatment options to our customers. As I mentioned, resource recovery is paramount to us. So we'll be providing selective nutrient, energy, and water recovery strategies depending on the needs of the user. This will all be um, powered by AI and optimization. So we'll be using real-time cloud-based supervision and smart sensor controllers with data-driven decision logic. More importantly, our Products will provide decentralized um, uh, treatment options to reduce the reliance on costly centralized infrastructure and provide on-site waste management options that prevent pollution at the source. So as I mentioned, our system will use winery, brewery, and domestic wastewater and treat it through anaerobic, um, anoxic, and aerobic membrane processes and produce quality reuse water, renewable energy from biogas, and a phosphorus-rich fertilizer. Our next steps will be to continue working with potential customers to identify those minimum viable product attributes, and then design, build, and operate to test these assumptions with our first client in the Hudson Valley in New York. Thank you. Now I'll take questions. Thank you, Abby, for that exciting presentation. Um, leave it to graduate students to figure out how to make wine and beer more efficiently. Excellent. Okay, we are going to start. <laughs> Anything we can do. Uh, let's start questions with uh, KP Ready. KP, uh, do you have a question for Abby? Yeah, um, I was trying to understand kind of is it process or what's the proprietary tech? So the process is um, a series of treatment um, options that will be tunable depending on the needs of the end user. So depending on our operating conditions, we can we can change the operating conditions to produce either more biogas um, if energy is really a concern, or if it's if it's you know um, and during the winter months when energy is of critical value, um, or if it's a, a customer that needs um, a, a lot of fertilizer on site. So our, our the wineries will be working with um, need fertilizer on site so we can tailor the, the treatment process to produce more fertilizer um, and so on. So the, the, the unique value add here is really that our process will be um, tunable to the needs of the user at a given time. Got and it. I can also... Yeah, I'm trying to, is it like a service or is it like you have an actual product? It would be a product, yes. Okay. And Elliot, do you want to speak to that a little bit? I see you you unmuted your camera. Yeah, I guess the question and answer is for the entire team, not just Abby, right? Um, yeah, so essentially we're just developing a process solution for whatever tailored water needs you need. So. We, Abby mentioned the uh, brewery and winery winery industry, um, and that's that's a unique industry in which you can that has a high COD wastewater, um, and you can really extract that high COD, so turn a lot of the carbon content into that um, into biogas, while also recovering some of the nutrients from it. Um, however, if you wanted to tailor this product to something different, so say drinking water quality reuse. You could even add on different steps at the end of this process. Um, so that's where we really emphasize the modularity and tunability of this product. Got it. I guess I'm trying to, it's not clear to me what the product is. Is it the software? It's it would a be the waste, 
Sorry, like, what ahead. can I put in a cardboard box and put duct tape around it? Like, what is the thing, the it, the product? It's a water treatment device that is powered by software. Got it. So there is a device. Yes, yes. Okay. Thank you. All right. Thanks, KP. Uh, David, would you like to ask the next question? Yes. Um, actually, following along sort of the lines that, that, that KP was, was questioning about. So at this stage, you've identified a process. Have you developed a bench scale version of this system? So I guess the, the answer to that is that we've developed, since the process is several treatment steps, in the lab we have done the individual steps. And putting it together into the, the full prototype we will be doing in the coming months. Okay. And then what are your team's plans for going from a lab bench scale prototype to a full scale functional unit that can serve, you know, one of the one of the multiple wineries or beer beer places that's opening up around campus. So we've been uh, in talks with a winery up in the Hudson Valley in New York that's interested in implementing a resource recovery water treatment system on their uh, at their winery. Um, and they're an interesting use case because they're they're interested in implementing um, regenerative agriculture um, on their their winery. So they're in a very experimental phase, um, and they're open to experimenting with us and kind of um, okay. doing some trial and error. All right, thank you. Thank you, David. Uh, Kendall, would you like to ask the next question? I'm actually still digging in a bit where um, KP and David left off. Um, so in terms of the product that is being offered, um, that is providing this water treatment, but you guys also mentioned um, AI relative to that and AI potentially being what is tuning this product. Um, right, Am I, did I hear that correctly? Yes. Okay, got it. <laughs> okay, so in this context, that AI is providing the fuel, um, you know, not to use Bitcoin language, but it's providing the fuel for this, um, for this system. Um, in this case, they're working together. You're providing implementation based on what is existing within this use case, so within this, this uh, brewery. Um, that brewery has specific issues. I'm, I'm going back to literally what is happening here because I know I think that's where the judges and where we're having a little bit of a disconnect and ensuring that we understand exactly what is being offered here in terms of whether this is product and service and whether there is something that's proprietary and can be protected um, because that of course elevates, at least for me, IP lawyer land, um, what can be monetized in a product service um, process, et cetera. So can you guys give a little bit more information there so it becomes crystal clear for us what exactly is the proprietary portion? Um, and, and, and not long, because I think John's looking at the clock. But um, what is the proprietary portion of what this, what, what culture is off? Anybody from the team? Oh, sure. But Eli, did you, you unmuted yourself? Did you uh, yeah, yeah, I can go ahead. Um, so on the artificial intelligence side of things, um, we are in the process of devising um, real-time algorithms that will be able to optimize the process of these treatments um, within the system itself. So as Abby, Abby said, that software is part of what we're developing and it's going to be part of our proprietary product in addition to the tunable system and the different modules that we'll be offering. So in other words, somebody 
purchases this treatment system. It's an on-site containerized wastewater treatment system that will that's equipped with sensors to um, establish treatment um, the the level of treatment at a given time in the system. And then that is all hooked up to a PLC and a computer that is going to say, okay, this is a good a good level for this um, this thing being sensed, and this is a bad level for this thing being sensed. And the computer will then be able to change treatment conditions to improve the operating conditions to improve effluent quality. Does that make more sense? Thank you so much, it does. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Kendall. Um, next, Leah, would you like to ask the next, judge, next judges? Sure, sure, I'll ask a quick question. So whenever you have any resource recovery, you always have to compare it against the cost of virgin material. And I noticed like, for example, with phosphorus, you mentioned we're at some peak phosphorus supply. So when do you think, I don't know, back of the envelope calculations that the cost of the recovery and the amount of material you would get would be more economical than just using virgin materials. Are we gonna see a big spike, say five years down the road? Is this company a little early um, to get to the point where it uh, makes sense economically to, uh, to sell these resources when you consider the cost of the module and the software you mentioned and all these other things? So that's a great question. Um, so even in just the recent years, as far back as 2008, there was an 800% increase in the cost of phosphorus. Um, and the market is highly volatile. So having a very um, steady product on site would be beneficial even, even now, before we reach peak phosphorus levels. I just, I'd, I'd like to add just a little bit. Um, Atlanta has some of the highest sewer rates in the country. Um, we're seeing new installations in California requiring decentralized wastewater treatment. Um, I'm sure that anybody involved with infrastructure kind of realizes at this point that centralized infrastructure is difficult. It, it may be efficient, but it's difficult to uh, modify. Um, it's difficult to update. All of our infrastructure is 20, 25 years outdated. Um, what we're going to see is rises in the prices of wastewater treatment, of freshwater provision, and this is a way to decrease both your sewer tap costs and your freshwater um, consumption costs uh, for an industry that is starving for both. So, um, in the end of the day, we're going to end up internalizing those profits, those revenues, um, rather than requiring that a centralized wastewater treatment facility, for instance, um, either pays through permit overages and fees, um, or that they update big centralized facilities to accommodate either lower nutrient release demands or um, higher water uh, consumption rates. Thank you, Thomas. Um, so, uh, Lisa, do you have a quick question for the team? I, I do have a very quick question. Uh, and it, it piggybacks on KPs. Um, Abby or anyone on the team, could you describe in a little more detail what this device looks like? I, I, I'm still having trouble imagining. Is it is it the size of a toaster? Is it the size of a tennis court? Is it a football field? Is it an open system to the elements? Is it something enclosed in a box? I can't visualize what this thing would look like if you came to my winery to install it. I can speak to that. Um, so this would be an enclosed system, mainly kind of like boxes, so reactors of whatever you want them to be specialized for this product. Um, but one of the beauty things, one of the beautiful things about this is that this product already has very high technology readiness levels. So they do this at basically in industrial scale. Really, we're just taking a more scalable size version of it that can be fit for whatever your water treatment need is at that scale. So for a brewery, they might be treating several thousand gallons of water per day. But and when you go to the industrial scale, they're treating millions of gallons of water per day. So really, it's just a smaller version of that in enclosed reactors um, that are really modular and tunable for whatever desirable purpose of that water treatment you want it to be. Thank you very much. Yeah. Great. Uh, thank you, Kulturia, for that great presentation, a great Q&A session. 
I'm sure we're all excited to visit Dr. Rosenstein's winery. I didn't know she had a winery. Uh, that's great. Um, great job, guys. Thank you. Okay. Uh, do remember, if you're out there as a participant, you can post your questions in the Q&A. Uh, the idea, I see John answered uh, one or two of those. Um, the idea is we'll discuss those uh, when the judges go off to deliberation. So teams, if you can maybe give a teasing answer and not the full answer so we have something to talk about, then we won't have to hear me say bad jokes for those for that period of time. So next up is Volta Pure. Volta Pure uses electricity to create an energy efficient, chlorine free technology to disinfect water without the need for central water disinfection facilities. Volta Pure is being presented by Mo Jaron. Uh, Mo, you may begin. For the introduction, Dr. Taylor, can you hear me? I can. I see Volta Pure behind you. Yes, I have a little bit more. Are you able to see my presentation? Yes, you're ready to All go. Right. So for the last 100 years, chlorine disinfection has improved human health and developed nations all over the world by reducing waterborne diseases like typhoid, cholera, and dysentery. And there's good reason for chlorine's popularity. It's cheap, it's efficient, it's reliable which is why the chlorine disinfection market is projected to break over $4 billion in 2025. But now what if I told you over the last 50 years, we've discovered that chlorine contributes to the formation of disinfection byproducts or DVPs. Now, why is this a problem? Well, when the organic matter in our drinking water mixes with chlorine, it forms these disinfection byproducts, many of which are carcinogenic or harmful to human health. Now there are alternative methods like membrane filtration, UV or ozone, but they aren't as popular as chlorine because of their high cost and energy consumption. Also, these alternatives are more difficult to apply in developing areas or remote regions that may already lack sanitation facilities or lack consistent power supplies. Now, because of these challenges, we need to develop more accessible, sustainable, and safe methods to disinfect our drinking water. Our solution is VoltaPure. Our team has developed a chlorine-free disinfection technology that uses an enhanced electric field and the natural biocidal effects of copper to disinfect all pathogens. Now, as you can see here, we've developed both hand-powered and smartphone-powered disinfection devices based off of our bench scale prototypes. Now, the smartphone-powered device is targeted for short-term outdoor activities like camping or hiking, while the hand-powered device is targeted for disaster regions places suffering from an earthquake or hurricane or something absolutely crazy. Like, let's say, I don't know, the entire state of Texas freezes over and leaves 15 million Americans without access to clean drinking water. In all seriousness, one of our teammates just recently moved down to Texas and he wished, he wished he had one of our devices with him for the four days he went with a boiling water advisory. And this is because our patent pending Voltapure technology is not only safe, powerful, energy efficient, and low cost, but minimizes the formation of those harmful DVPs. Not only that, but Voltapure's projected cost is very competitive when you compare it to the standard methods used today like chlorine or ozone. Now, other potential applications for Voltapure include point of use systems like water bottles, faucets, tabletop pitchers, even shower heads. But as the technology scales, it can be integrated directly into the distribution line, as you can see here to provide antimicrobial power from when your water leaves the water treatment plant to when it reaches your tap at home, or in this case, the end users. Now, our team is comprised of three graduate students, all of us having grown up outside of the US, we understand the privilege and importance of having clean and safe tap water in our homes. Not only this, but we've only recently started to jump into the entrepreneurial side of things here, and we were fortunate enough to participate in so many competitions and workshops over the very, I'll say, unprecedented 2020 year. We've pitched our innovation to the NAE uh, COVID-19 Call for Engineering Action, the NSF I-Corps program, as well as a few others. Voltapure has also been advised by industrial mentors within the Global Center for Medical Innovation located here in central Atlanta. And just last year, we took finalists in the Water Council's Water Tech Hub Challenge, giving us the privileged opportunity to speak with Zern Industries, technical and R&D experts who are leaders in their field of engineered water solutions. Our next steps are to build a pilot at the Gwinnett County Water Treatment Plant. We have a good relationship with Gwinnett and they would offer us the space and support for a larger scale system. We anticipate our pilot system to be upwards of 10 to 100 times larger than our bench scale. 
So we would need further funding, not only to support the material cost, but the personnel and especially time needed to, to lead that effort. Now, it's important to note that there are over 1.1 million Americans that lack a piped water connection. And this will become a major problem for providing access to clean water in the US. But this offers us an opportunity to install Voltapir smart conveyance systems in the future, since new pipelines will need to be built to combat this growing plumbing poverty. As we look to the future to replace chlorine and also augment it with Voltapure and other alternative technologies, the potential impact goes beyond just the 1.1 million Americans, but the 800 million people worldwide that lack access to clean drinking water every day. We believe Voltapure is not only the solution for modernizing disinfection in developed nations like the US, but can also be the safe and sustainable alternative for developing countries looking to build more standard disinfection distribution systems in the future. Now, obviously, we believe chlorine is not the future of water disinfection, no. But if you want clean drinking water, we can make it Volta Pure. Thank you. Um, thank you. Excellent. Excellent. Uh, presentation. Let us go straight to the judges. Uh, and I would like to invite uh, David Frost to ask the first question. And yes, I see your team is joining you. That's great. So a very quick first question. Have you drunk water that was being purified by your prototype system? Yes, that's an excellent question. So I personally have not gotten to, but let me see if any of my technical and entrepreneurial leads have. Yes, they have. Was it delicious, guys? Well, uh, I'm going to uh, take this question. So actually, we cannot drink or eat anything uh, in our lab. So that's the reason we have never drink the water that we purified. But if uh, one day we, we come up with a, a product that sell in the market, I believe that I will drink the water that we treat. What, um, what target um, metrics have you identified that are required for you to be adopted um, broadly in the market? So um, I can I can start off with that, and I think John Feng can add on to that. Um, a couple of key metrics for our system would be uh, the copper concentration that we would end up adding to the water. Uh, the, the key target here being the uh, 1,300 parts per billion, or 1, 000, uh, basically 1.3 um, micrograms per uh, milligrams per liter of uh, copper, which is the EPA set maximum contaminant limit. And we have consistently been performing below that, achieving around 99.999% uh, inactivation of E. coli with uh, as low as 200 parts per billion uh, or up to 500 parts per billion of copper in the system. Uh, so that would be one um, key category. And also then the, the level of inactivation for which we generally have been uh, trying pathogens such as uh, E. coli uh, and in some experimental cases, a broader range, including I think Staphylococcus and other uh, bacteria. But going forward, I think we would need to be able to prove this with uh, more variable waters, uh, waters such as waters may, which may have higher turbidity levels or waters which may have higher conductivity levels. But the key metrics that we've identified so far, we have been able to perform pretty well on. John Feng, is there anything that you'd like to add to this? Yeah, I think Mason's got a very good answer. And also, I want to say that we have already treated water. Uh, we just collect water from Chattahoochee River uh, and treat uh, and disinfect the water, and also got pretty good results. All right, I, I, I'm done. Move on to the next, uh, folks. Thank you, uh, David. Uh, Kendall, would you like to treat uh, this team with another question? Sure, John. Uh, so, guys, how long do you see um, a individual system, specifically those that are considered to be field use systems, like those that are powered by the cell phones, working um, in fields? Like, what's the replacement factor? Something you want to go ahead. 
Well, if my understanding is right, so you're asking like how long the system can be used if we power it by, the, by our cell phone, right? Correct. Yes. So actually, um, there are two consumable consumables in our system. One is the uh, consumable uh, copper electrode, which we usually uh, currently we replace it uh, for uh, every uh, every twelve hours. And for the electricity, it costs. So the electric electricity is pretty low, since that we can treat maybe ten liters of the water with only one percent of your cell phone battery. So that's not a concern for the electricity, but more about the uh, consumable uh, copper electrodes. Okay, so what is the, I guess, then moving from those portable systems to the larger systems, um, how long are we looking for in terms of placement or the usage of the copper load? Because that goes back into whether it becomes viable in larger systems. Yeah, thanks for the question. So. Uh, actually, we have two complementary systems. One, as we mentioned, we use copper and electric field so that we can use less copper dosage and make it make the water safe. And also, we have another uh, technology use uh, only electric field to disinfect water so that we do not need to dose any copper into the uh, uh, into the system. And in in this sense, uh, if we apply this system uh, into the water distribution system. Uh, Theoretically, the electrodes can be used forever so that we don't need to change. But for now, uh, we only can use it for maybe 15 days as that, that's the best value we can reach. And we want to like increase this value to almost forever by like uh, get, get more opportunity to expose to uh, industry and also get the, uh, uh, the, this price. Um, and just a quick add-on to Jan Feng's answer uh, from the commercial. So, from the commercial perspective, both of these approaches present their own unique um, advantages and challenges. One uh, where we have replaceable, uh, consumable uh, electrodes. Uh, that approach, first of all, as we go for larger pipes, the the central coaxial electrode also becomes larger, so the lifespan a should increase. But b even when uh, even since it's consumable. Uh, that actually provides us an opportunity to build eventually a revenue model that revolves with utilities since they will need to replace the central electrode which is a service that a future company can possibly provide to them and on the other hand when we go for the all electric system which does not release copper that involves a far more advanced central electrode which has nano wires grown on it and that means we can have a higher upfront Cost, but a uh, lower repeating cost uh, to the system. Just a final add-on. We don't see the consumable electrode as a negative in a potential business model because it would be kind of like the printer system, right? You buy the printer and then you keep buying the ink. That kind of sense for disinfection. So we see a good possible profit margin with that. Thank you, guys. Thanks, Kendall. Uh, next, can I ask uh, Leo if he has a question for the team about printer? Yeah, a lot of what I was going to ask was already taken, so I'll go with a little bit of an unconventional route. So I see the demand from a perspective of public policy. It seems like it would be a good idea to move away from, say, uh, the byproducts that might be carcinogenic. But has there been a, an outspoken demand from water authorities? I notice you have this pilot program, which kind of suggests that. But if a water authority could spend money, is this where they would spend that money? Or is there other things that are higher up on their list um, aside from changing their disinfected technology? Um, yeah, that's a pretty good question. I think uh, I'll, I'll take it to begin with as the uh, newly minted consultant from the team. Uh, but I think just, just based on whatever I've in, uh, on, from my first few months in the uh, environmental consultancy industry, uh, I do see quite a conversation going on about disinfection byproducts because even though it hasn't caught up with um, federal level regulations quite that much, it has uh, received a lot of bad press uh, in general and especially utilities that are more at the cutting edge which also tend to be utilities that have the money to spend on this like bigger utilities in California or on the east coast in the northeast New York and all of these I think that is where we could start off with uh, potential uh, customers who uh, where 
the residents do tend to hold um, the utilities a little more accountable for things like this because those utilities tend to have the more basic aspects of water treatment in order. But this is actually a, a good point because we, I think, do need to connect with smaller utilities and see where this falls in their priority list uh, because that might influence our strategy in the future. Thanks, Nassim. Thanks, uh, Leo. Uh, Lisa, would you like to ask the next question from the judges? Yes. Um, so, in between, well, let me start this way. You showed a large scale to beginning crisis management scenario, and then you moved to a small scale camping trip scenario. Uh, but in the middle, I think it was the second or third slide, you showed just general utility of, of you know, getting clean water to houses. And, and, um, general usage. So my question is, it looks as if in that scenario you are aiming to replace the entire pipe system, water infrastructure system, everywhere. Is that true? In the grand scheme of things, we would say yes. If we could okay. replace everything and take out chlorine, of course. Chlorine contributes to this problem of DVPs. It's unavoidable. And so in the future, we believe that chlorine will have to be replaced and reduced. So our goal is to start by augmenting the secondary disinfection in pipelines with Voltapure or alternative technologies. Because we dose excess chlorine at the end of the treatment cycle so that our water stays clean until it reaches our tap. Instead of dosing toxic chemicals, if we can replace the disinfection system right in the pipeline, we can reduce the amount of chlorine used in the treatment process and kind of look towards the future as our technology matures, where then we can apply it to the rest of the distribution system and, and treatment system. Um, and to, uh, Dr. Rosenstein, to add to that, I think uh, uh, to, uh, also regarding your concerns about replacing entire uh, uh, pipe infrastructures. So for one thing, it is actually something it, that cities do tend to do more often than we think because aging pipe infrastructure is an issue all over the US and currently a lot of it is undergoing replacements even though it's piecemeal eventually that begins to add up i think everyone here would be familiar with the large uh, main break that we had on the gt campus last summer so that was a pipe i think from the late uh, 19th century and once something like that goes the you need a large replacement project and whenever such a project comes in that's an opportunity for us to pitch our technology to the city, saying that not only can you replace it with a smart 21st century pipe solution, but also reduce the uh, disinfection costs at your treatment plant, because now the pipe will be bearing some of the responsibilities uh, for disinfection. And uh, like Mo pointed out at the end of our presentation, um, there's around 1.1 million people in the US, in American cities currently, who don't yet have uh, to a pipe drinking water, which has been called plumbing poverty uh, in, in uh, research circles. Uh, and I think that too presents a good opportunity for utilities as they build out that pipe infrastructure uh, to use smarter pipes rather than just using the age old systems. Thank you very much. All right, guys. Um, KP, do you have a quick question? And we would ask only one yeah. team member to respond. Uh, just real quick, so when you think there's lots of opportunities, you guys show two different kind of uh, footprints of a product. If someone gave you like a million bucks, what would be your tight first market to get to revenue? Don't unmute. I think you shocked him with a million bucks. Well, I mean, if you're going to put a VC on the panel, I mean, geez, <laughs> be prepared for that. <laughs> Who's going to um, answer? Do you guys, uh, Mo Jianfeng, do you want to take it or should I? Okay. Uh, well, I, I would, if, if you gave us a million dollars, I'd talk to you about that, the call. But uh, if we did have, we would start by focusing on utilities because uh, I think they are in general receptive to such technologies and we will need to loop them in any way uh, for our pilot tests and that would also avoid the large amount of costs that would come with 
uh, marketing it directly to consumers and just getting to uh, the end user in a market that is already fairly crowded with big players like Brita. Even though we are distinct, convincing people that we're distinct could be an uphill battle for which a million dollars could fall short. So I feel if we had that kind of capital, we would start um, start with the utilities and uh, targeting government governmental clients uh, so that there's fewer of them to convince and we can invest more of that in uh, fine-tuning our R&D and running the pilots that would be necessary to get the data to then eventually make it to consumers. Awesome. All right. Um, thanks, KP. Thanks, guys. I hope someone got a screenshot of your faces when KP asked you what you would do with a million dollars if he gave it to you. Uh, that was really great. Thank you, Volta Pure. Um, the last team that we're going to hear from today, the last finalist, is River Recon. River Recon designed a sensor to swiftly, inexpensively, and efficiently identify microplastics in continuous streams of water. River Recon is going to be presented today by Aaron Kowalski. Hi, Aaron. Uh, Aaron, you may begin. Hi. Thank you. Um, so, if your kitchen sink is overflowing, oh, I'm sorry, our slides are one sec. Thank you. Um, it's been a great competition. We're very excited. Okay. Um, we see your if your kitchen sink is overflowing, what would you grab first? A mop? A bucket? Well, why don't we just turn off the faucet? All this is to say we can come up with a thousand and one ways to remove plastic from water, but it's an endless effort if we don't stop the flow of plastic into our waterways. Addressing this problem becomes exponentially more difficult when we can't see it, which is the case with the microplastics in our water system. Microplastic, those plastic particles less than five millimeters along their longest dimension, pose a significant threat to human health and ecological system. Frankly, the most alarming aspect about this emerging contaminant is the uncertainty surrounding it, which is precisely why we need continuous monitoring. However, current ASTM methods cannot bridge that monitoring gap because of their restrictive two-step process, which requires labor-intensive sampling on-site and then thousands of dollars worth of lab equipment and lengthy analyses times. In comes River Recon. We are proposing consolidating microplastic detection into a one-step process by analyzing microplastic samples in situ. The backbone of our design is the sensor, which employs fluorescence coupled with machine learning to detect microplastic particles. Our innovation changes the detection game by bringing in situ detection to the industry and increasing sampling capacity, allowing us to monitor for microplastics on a much larger scale. Our preliminary prototype has had success seeing microplastics down to approximately 50 micrometers, the top row of images demonstrates the response of plastic to our light sources, while the bottom left image shows our detection algorithm output after an initial iteration. With a unit price of only $300, it drastically reduces the cost and cuts the processing time from days to mere seconds, enabling us to potentially integrate our technology for a variety of target markets. River Recon is working with Georgia Tech Venture Labs on customer discovery to develop an understanding of the market potential of our device. We've conducted over 20 customer discovery interviews thus far with three major markets, the food and beverage industries and the wastewater treatment industry. These industries were chosen as focal points due to the need for quality monitoring in their processes. Take the food industry as an example. In countless studies of consumer products, microplastics have been found with the average consumer ingesting tens of thousands of plastic particles per year through their food. With microplastics found in many ingredients, identification of these contaminants would have a profound impact on consumer health and consumer trust. It's the same story when you look at the beverage industry, with many studies showing microplastics in the products we consume. Even in processes where we'd expect incoming water to be treated, like in breweries, there are microplastics. Lastly, we see wastewater's impact on the environment as our final market. Billions of microplastics pass through wastewater treatment systems and into the natural environment. This causes ecosystem degradation, buildup of aquatic debris, and the destruction of our natural resources, impacting many industries along the way. As each of these sectors has an impact on each of our daily lives and well-beings, and require frequent sampling for water contaminants and have shown interest in emerging contaminants, 
we found untapped potential for our device to be integrated into these existing monitoring regimes. At this point, we are patent pending with our technology and feel that the best opportunity to break into our target markets is by conducting pilot studies within the food industry. We see our beachhead market as sustainably minded food corporations. From these pilot programs, we would hope to expand our business by finding potential licensure interest to expand our market base. Our model includes working with technology representatives to broaden our customer reach and assist with our device marketing. Our revenue will come from hardware sales and related data services. We plan to expand our testing to environmental samples and additional materials in order to generate more reference data and make more useful measurements for our partners. Additionally, we will be further developing our machine learning framework and testing our data set to then evaluate final predictive capabilities. We are looking to leverage the connections we have built with research facilities and universities as a way of verifying our testing capabilities using ASCM methods. Ultimately, we hope our device can be used to aggregate data on microplastic prevalence globally, allowing us to get one step closer to sealing that tap. Thank you, and we look forward to hearing your questions. Great, thank you so much, uh, Aaron and River Recon. Uh, Kendall, Kendall, are you ready to do some recon? <laughs> I am. Here. Hey, Tim Purvis. Uh, sorry, that's a student who's moved on from Georgia Tech, but who I know very well, and Matt Falcon. Uh, Kendall. The, com the comedy gets me every time, JT. All right, so guys, um, the $100, um, but that was the method that we are moving towards um, monetization. Is there a market that determines, or what is the market for the units individually? Or is there a scale that exists for the units that they go to a different price, such that a $300 unit is, is something that's more of a handheld um, unit and something that's doing more of a larger container or a large, you know, uh, canister, whatever. Um, is something that's a larger price and a, and a different implementation cost for a system. Just looking at, at, at how the implementation works for um, the product itself. Definitely, Tim's gonna answer that question for you. Yeah, I hope you can hear me. Um, <clears throat> so a big focus that we've been uh, going after is developing the sensor technology itself. Uh, and the reason for that is that the sensor can then be integrated into a different number of scenarios, you can have it where, like you were saying, uh, you can do a grab sample and have it there where you just put something in, or you could, uh, in theory, have it in a situation where it's continuous flow and you're continually tracking microplastics. Uh, each user will have a different requirement, so uh, a lot of the current processes uh, for those three markets that we had identified use primarily grab samples. Um, and so we would be using that current uh, $300 model uh, and that's that's our price, that's not the unit that we'd be selling it for. Um, so we'd probably be using that model and then uh, for different industries, potentially things where you uh, are more interested in contaminal, or chemical contaminants, uh, that's where you'd want a more uh, in-stream kind of monitoring option and that would definitely increase your price uh, as we'd have to add some other uh, components with that. Uh, but we don't think that the other models would have a significantly different uh, price. It may just be more uh, money going towards operation and maintenance. I hope that answers. Uh, it does. A little bit, is there, uh, and I guess the, the second part or the second bubble was the technological implementation. Are there partners that exist once there are once there is this this monitoring? So you have found now that there are these microparticles that exist. Are there partners, partners, or um, other licensees, et cetera, that will exist for you guys to be able to have that one-stop shop for not only detection but also removal? And have you considered it or started to look into that? I I can answer that question for you. Um, so we have been looking at uh, people who are doing both detection and removal um, because obviously that would be our market competitors. Um, so far from what we have seen, there has not been um, any 
products that have gone to market that are doing removal. There's a lot of research in that area, um, and it's using very different technologies for their detections. Um, a lot of what we've seen is devices where uh, they're designed for the ocean, so they are placed in the ocean for a few months and constantly um, detecting microplastics, but it's not giving you instantaneous data, so we're not really sure how um, the removal will come up with that. Um, there's a lot of uh, autonomous vehicles that are being researched in this area as well. Um, we, again, nothing has gone to market at the moment, but we would be very interested in seeing how we could work with them. Tim's going to add to that. Yeah, just really briefly um, in terms of, yes, uh, <laughs> there are existing um, groups that kind of consolidate monitoring practices. So that is one thing that we may be looking at in our market where there's already contractors that go out and do that sampling and evaluation for folks. Uh, so that may be one uh, avenue into that market that we can reach in easily. Thanks, Tim. Thank you. Thanks, Erin. And thanks, Kendall. All right, um, Leo, would you like to ask a micro question? Yeah, sure. So I really like to hear that you guys did uh, some customer discovery. Often when you do customer discovery, you end up pivoting to a different uh, different avenue or a different idea. So I wanted to know what kind of insights you receive from your customer discovery that suggests there's a demand for your particular uh, your particular plan. Sure, I can answer that question. So we actually had a very big pivot initially in our customer discovery journey. Um, so we initially were designing this device for researchers. We thought there would be a lot of demand for this in research because researchers take a lot of time to collect their microplastic samples in order to analyze them using laboratory equipment. Um, and that demand definitely exists, but we have realized that research is not a very profitable market, um, even though it is a great market and we hope to get there eventually. Um, so our next step was going to the wastewater industry, and it really was dependent on which wastewater um, treatment facilities we were talking to. So newer treatment facilities who are interested in research and interested in emerging contaminants were very interested in the device. Obviously, through our customer discovery process, we weren't talking directly about the device or microplastics, but they yeah. were fluidly bringing that up. But then when you talk to a um, we talked to one facility in Athens, Georgia, um, that didn't have um, as much interest. So then we pivoted and we thought, who would else would have the money and the interest? So that's where we ended up at um, food and beverage. So we've done preliminary talks um, through that customer discovery. And so we have found broad interest in emerging contaminants and broad interest in um, just being ahead of the curve, ahead of the regulation, um, especially for the FDA. But we have not, we have to continue that journey. We have to um, see where it takes us. So just to summarize, the food and uh, beverage industry, they wanted a faster and cheaper machine to detect microplastics. That's what they were essentially looking towards. Uh, yes, so they their main concern is they want to be ahead of any regulation that comes about. So. They want to know what these emerging contaminants are and how they can monitor for them before the regulation happens, because otherwise they're in a bad position. Okay, thanks. Let, uh, thank you, Leo. Uh, thanks, team. Let's pivot to Lisa. So my question was essentially was Kendall's question. You know, if detecting them is great, but <laughs> removing them is even better. But she talked about, but I don't, I don't think you fully answered, uh, explored the whole topic. So my question to you is, what is your ideal vision for your company? Do you want to partner with a company who can do the removal, or do you want that to be part of your company? If you, if you could choose uh, right now and design the company in total. Just one team member answer, please. Um, I'll take this one. Um, yeah, so I think it would be to focus on the monitoring and identification of microplastics um, because that is what we really excel at. Uh, we want to be able to focus at that and provide the best te technology in that regards. 
Um, there's a lot of options of companies that we could partner with potentially um, and some new technologies that are coming up that we could potentially integrate into a kind of solution package. Uh, and I think that would be most beneficial. Otherwise, I think that uh, we're playing in areas outside of our strengths. Um, we'd like to focus on what we do know and are good at. Thank you very much. Thanks, Tim. Thanks, Lisa, for the question. Uh, KP, are you ready? Nice. Uh, <laughs> um, so walk me through the, the technology. We've been talking about the problem a lot. Got it. But what is it that you guys are, what have you built? Yeah, I, I don't mean to hog the Q&A uh, responses. I just happen to have the prototype here with me. Uh, so essentially the way the process works is uh, we have design for grab samples right now where uh, we have a container that holds your water sample. We have it surrounded by a number of different LEDs um, and light sources. They're each hitting it with different wavelengths of light uh, that we've figured out from some proof of concepts and then from the initial prototypes. And then uh, we take images for the response of the sample to each of those different wavelengths of light, pass that into a machine learning algorithm, uh, then uses object detection and then some classification to decide if it's looking at, you know, plastic or just some sediment or fertilizer that's still in the waterway. Uh, and we've got pretty good accuracy with that, or I should say precision. Sorry, using those words with machine learning is a bit <laughs> of a minefield, but um, so we've had pretty good results from the prototype that we've created thus far. Uh, we've done some changes to our prototype, uh, run some simulations on how we should structure it. So we're currently changing it uh, so that we have a higher clarity image, which we think will get us kind of to a better limit of detection. That's our that's our end goal with the technology. Got it. So Got it. just playing back, you're, you're running multi-spectrum and open CV and detecting particles. Yes, and then so we're detecting the particles and then we're classifying whether or not it's plastic or some other thing yeah. based on, yeah. The, the second set of the algorithm, yeah. yeah. Thank you. Thanks, KP. And for the last judge's question of the day, uh, David Frost, would you like to ask the last question of this team? Yeah, I'm gonna ask two very short, quick questions. Almost need one word each. The first one is, how clear does your water need to be to allow your technology to work? Um, I can't give you a specific turbidity, uh, but it's probably, uh, it has worked at about 50 NTU. Um, that's the, that's what I know off the top of my head. I can probably email you with uh, some better stats on that. Okay. And then the, the second related piece is that if you take a grab sample and you put it into a container, um essentially that's a sedimentation um issue how do you prevent sedimentation from occurring so that uh, all of the particles don't drop to the bottom while you're taking your images yeah so uh two quick things uh one benefit is uh, we can take advantage of density differences, and so a lot of the plastics will stay towards the range where we can uh, take images um, with enough clarity for enough time uh, to hit all the different wavelengths. And then on top of that, one thing that we are considering doing is adding agitation um, so that you're taking multiple pictures, getting better data, and then trying to get around that settling problem. All right. Thank you. Thank you uh, to River Recon. Thanks, uh, David, for that last question. And thanks really to all the teams. If the, the folks on moderator can unmute and we can join me in clapping and congratulating all the teams, uh, that'd be great. Uh, very innovative uh, and exciting presentations. Uh, we now need to send our judges off to a shark tank but um, so that they can deliberate. But fortunately, the water is very pure. Uh, there are no microplastics uh, to be worried about, and so we're going to give them 
20 minutes to do their deliberation, hopefully come back uh, with uh, two winners. And we will continue to host the, the um, entrepreneurs can all turn their cameras on and we can uh, start to answer some of the questions that have come through the Q&A as well as uh, others that may, may be added. So goodbye to the judges. We'll see you very soon. Okay. I just wanted to say I love your jokes. I don't know where you come up with these. It's, it's just being a father. That's it, dad jokes. That's it. Hey, John, try to figure out where to go. Oh, um, maybe Emily, can you? KP, I'll send you an email. Okay. All right, so I'm trying to figure out where is the beginning of this list. All right, so I know, John, you've answered it, but let's start at the bottom because we've got some, some minutes here. Is there a role? of structural engineer in recommending the product for use since the pullout force might be related to analysis of a particular structure? Uh, sure, and yeah, I can take that. Uh, <laughs> absolutely, um, in the beginning. Um, as I said in my response, even on jobs which are not a design build contract, the design of ground anchor uh, interaction with the soil is such a particular thing that uh, contractors are the only ones who, who typically design that portion of the structural system. And then, you know, once the technology has been adopted more, um, then structural engineers can really take the mantle and be the ones prescribing this kind of, kind of anchor uh, for different jobs uh, that they might be designing. And thanks, John. Yeah. Uh, I'm just going from the bottom up. The next question down there is, have you piloted the various options you've discussed? I don't know if this question was for, for you or for the next team. Uh, it's still for you, John. Have you piloted it? I think that question was for Culturia, but uh, we, we do have um, design prototypes that I've developed. Uh, it, it's a functional system. Uh, we haven't brought it to the field yet, but uh, it, it is functional. We've, we've designed them um, to be and everything. Thanks. And what about Culturia, since the uh, question may have been for you all? Are you all on the call? DJ Fang. Uh, yeah. Fang. Um, yeah, so every uh, reactor configuration we talked about, we have it at the lab scale. And then uh, our mentor, Dr. Yangsheng Chen, also has a uh, pilot scale and MBR, anaerobic membrane bioreactor, uh, that he was awarded from a USDA grant that we will be using to treat on campus wastewater uh, at Georgia Tech. Nice. Um, I guess it's fair to ask a question since a judge asked Voltapure if they would drink, had drunk the water from their system. Have you drunk the beer or wine from your system? Not as of yet, but hoping, hoping by the fall we'll have um, uh, at least uh, an anaerobic reactor up in uh, Pine Bush where we can start. But that being said, we, the wine takes several years to grow, so probably not the wine for a couple of years. But <laughs> You can do a beer in a few weeks. Yeah, maybe we'll we'll get some hops growing. We have a greenhouse. Excellent. That was happening in the Daniel lab. <laughs> All right, Eric Marks asks, BioBuilt, uh, is the installation of the anchor faster than traditional methods? If so, what factors allow for an increase in productivity? John. Yeah, so I'll take this uh, opportunity to show off my prototype in the lab here. So basically, this uh, you know this newer anchor, this portion you see here, uh, expands into the configuration that I showed in the presentation. Uh, and what that does is that allows you to transfer the same amount of load that might take 20 or 30 feet of a cylindrical surface like this to transfer to the soil. It allows you to transfer that within you know five or fewer feet. That means that the overall length of an anchor is much shorter than it would otherwise be, which means you can reduce the, uh, the time spent drilling for those anchors by 30 or 40 percent on a typical project. And the great thing about this anchor is that the installation procedure is very similar to what's already in place. So uh, laborers and operators in the field really don't have any adjustment to make in order to use this compared to what they use now. So that answers your question, Eric. Thanks, John. I thought that was a samurai sword. <laughs> 
Go ahead. Go much safer now. Okay, uh, Eric Marx asks Volta Pure, how does the cost of replacing failing pipe infrastructure compare to implementing your system to a water treatment system? Uh, more specifically, is there a cost savings to implementing your system versus traditional maintenance and operations? Is that Volta Pure or is that Culturia? No, pipes is us. So yeah, we'll we'll take that. I I think I've already taken taken a shot at it. So Mo, if you'd like to add. Yeah, you're breaking up a little bit, Missy. Cool. Okay. Is it any better now? Yeah, yeah, you're fine. Yeah, but if you if Mo would answer, you know, that would be fine. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So I think this question Nissan kind of went into it a little bit. Um. So it talks about replacing the pipes. So yes, so obviously uh, we, we discussed how DBPs are a problem and we want to replace chlorine. Going into sort of commercial side of things, it is gonna be a little bit, people, people are gonna be hesitant to want to just replace all the pipes initially. And that's why part of our market is looking at developing countries because um, they have yet to build these standard systems, many of them. And so it'll be easier to just initially go in and implement a more modern solution there, right? And we have, we've seen several examples of this in different things like like e-credit cards and, and, and Apple Pay and things like that, where we go from credit card to Apple Pay more simpler in, in countries like China and develop, um, and other developing areas. While here we're struggling to switch to, to e-payment um, e methods because we have gotten so used to credit cards rather than just going from cash or something like that. So we can implement new pipes, modern pipes in developing countries much easier than starting here. So that's a potential market that we see. Um, but I think Nissim worked into, um, Nissim, do you want to discuss what your answer is? I'm not really getting it. You forgot about Sorry? No, I'm just saying, uh, also Venmo. Yeah. No. Yeah, but, so I think yeah, Mo, Mo covered whatever I had, it just, just to quickly summarize what, what I had said in that answer was uh, that, first of all, this, is, especially when it comes to replacing infrastructure, it is extremely case by case because it depends on so many factors that are extremely localized, like the cost of labor, uh, whether the piping is buried or not, and so many other things. And uh, I would say that considered the approach that Mo has described makes a lot more sense for us. And if we look at it just from a material cost perspective, our system has in our calculations at least come out to be uh, competitive with or cheaper than existing systems. However, we must remember that these existing systems like chlorine disinfection or even the kind of pipes we have nowadays have been evolving and scaling up for decades. So the economies of scale are heavily in their favor uh, and we are going to have to figure out how to challenge them on the cost front uh, considering that factor. Thank you. Uh, I'm going to pull another one at random for uh, Culturia. Will the process alter the flavor of the beer and wine at all? Uh, I can speak to this one. So. Um, it depends what you use out of our product, right? So we emphasize energy, uh, the reuse water, and then also the recovered biosolids, which can be used for growing hops or say grapes. Um, so in terms of water and brewing, I know that they really uh, require some soft water. So that's free of calcium and magnesium ions, or at least in very low concentration. And that's why a lot of uh, major brewers like Sierra Nevada and stuff have operations in like Asheville, North Carolina, or like Sierra Nevada, because the mountain water is a lot softer than the harder water. Um, so that's why we emphasize kind of the modularity and tunability of the system. So the water that we'll be getting out of our product will still have organics and still have ions that may pose issues to say the water if you were using it to uh, brew. Um, but then you could install say a selective nanofiltration barrier at the end to remove a lot of the organics and then retain the ions that you desire for that brewing process. Um, I can't speak as much to the biosolids uh, growing the hops and the grapes, maybe Abby can, but it's maybe. <laughs> yeah, I mean, the, in, for grapes specifically, I don't imagine that the biosolids would affect the taste at all. You have a pretty big 
um, the the plant itself does a lot of its own internal regulation. So it stores most things um, that it comes in contact with in the root system. And then the stuff that is really needed for the fruit is relegated pretty pretty effectively throughout the plant structure. I am not as familiar with hops growing, but um, I imagine in a soil matrix, um, you're not going to get flavor differences. If you were doing a hydroponic setup, you might experience some, uh, you know, there's less of a bio barrier um, between the, the nutrients you're applying and the plant. But that's a great question, and we'll definitely keep our, our uh, I was going to say eyes on it, but even yeah. the quality. it could even improve the taste, you know. Yeah, I mean, there's a thing called the bio, the life force in in the wine industry, and um, there's been an increasing push towards this regenerative agriculture for for um, growing grapes, and um, I imagine that we'll experience um, some enthusiasm when people can get actually involved in the process. Just real quick, the, uh, before the last left tech, uh, which is a big water conference for operators, tons of water, water industry people, um, you could actually try a beer that was brewed through direct potable reuse. So I do want to emphasize that for direct potable reuse, we do have to go through reverse osmosis. Um, and reverse osmosis is going to remove ions. You'll have to add back in ions. But I wrote out a little response there that just said that Coca-Cola produces Dasani here in town, and they just take tap water and reverse osmosis, add back in electrolytes that they use for their specific taste. Um, so yeah, but it's not going to be poop taste. Thank you, guys. I think we have to jump into this pool question because it's been asked twice. Um, could VoltaPure have applications to swimming pool disinfection and um, following up on that question, have you looked at the numbers for the pool market? Yeah, so I'll just kick that off. Um, since uh, John showed his prototype, I, I picked up one of the bad boys <laughs> in the lab. So this is one of our bench go prototypes you might have seen during our presentation. It's nothing too fancy, just copper pipe, some PVC tubings. The novelty of our technology is, of course, the way in which we disinfect water inside, right? So. Just with this, you can see it's like a pipe structure, so we could recirculate the the pool water through our device just as well. Absolutely, yes, we could we could disinfect pool water with it. And I think Nissim went a little bit into it because we have actually we have some publications that Jumping and, and Nissim have worked on to demonstrate um, related systems, right? Because chlorine in pools um, is to kind of kill off pathogens, bacteria, and deter algae growth. So we've demonstrated that algae, um, algae disinfection and deterring algae growth can be done with copper or copper sulfate and, and can be done with, with, with our technology as well. Um, the, the important part, though, with Voltapur is that we're able to tune and control the amount of copper and at the rate at which it is released. And so we could have kind of a more fancy way of disinfecting pool water. And it could efficientize and lower the cost of, of what we currently do now, which is just dump chlorine in. Thank you, Mo. Um, I, there are a couple more questions here. Uh, they're for teams that have spoken up. I, I guess I have one myself for River Recon since our, I don't see one in the list. Is, is Matt still on the, the line? I'm not sure if you can see me. Yeah, I, I guess there is a River Recon question on the list, by the way. Uh, yeah, I got to ask this one, though. Sorry, Nissi. Uh, so since you aren't necessarily doing rivers anymore, have you thought about a different, because I think the Atlanta Falcons might be a good name for your venture. But <laughs> more seriously, um, I've already actually suggested this to Matt. Um, have you all thought about a different name for your venture? Is it relevant to choose a new name? I'll say we have not necessarily reconsidered the name. Um, if there are any suggestions, um, we're open to suggestions because it I did won't. start uh, besides <laughs> the Atlanta Falcons. <laughs> no, sorry, I don't know. Um, uh, we alternatively we have not named the device. So, uh, do you have any pun-based suggestions for that? I mean, anyone in the audience, we would be very thankful for that. <laughs> 
so there, there is a question. Thanks, Nassim, for pointing that out. How does the cost of, wait, is that right? Where is the question for, uh, for you all? I think it's the question of how has it been tested on, on complex environmental water, ah, wastewater yeah. samples? Been moved, yeah. So do you all have a, an answer verbally for the, for the audience for that? Yes. Um, yeah, I was just starting to type out my answer for that. Uh, Yes and no. We've started using environmental samples, so taking grab samples from local waters around where we live. And ironically or surprisingly, uh, the water's actually too clean um, in that we have such low turbidity that we can't get all of the, you know, signal noise that we're trying to, to generate. So uh, we're considering either finding some very dirty water to use as a base and then, uh, you know, uh, look at microplastics in that or uh, potentially making some, you know, bench top version of what you'd consider uh, bad surface water to look like. You could go out to the Chattahoochee. Even then, it's not enough turbidity. It's, uh, it's, we want a very bad, signal to see the, the total limits. <laughs> Got it. Okay. Uh, there is a question for um, Biobuilt. You compared Riga to the conventional ground anchors and highlighted the advantages of Biobuilt over that. Are there new entrants into ground anchors that may impact Biobuilt's competitiveness? See that you've answered. I, I can't see the answer, but if you can verbally provide that to the audience. Yeah, so the, the newest kind of other technology that's in the space uh, is called a hollow core soil nail. So essentially it's uh, similar to a conventional anchor, but the uh, anchor itself is hollow and it acts as the drill bit during installation. So that the uh, installer is pumping a cement grout through the center of the anchor while it's being installed. Uh, and this allows you to install fairly, um, quite a bit faster in certain ground conditions, especially like uh, loose sands or if you have boulders and cobbles. Uh, but as I mentioned in the answer, there's really nothing to prevent you from using that system and also using the Riga's expansive mechanism. So together, they can actually be sort of twice as good uh, combining their strength. Excellent. Thank you. Uh, Volta Pure, you mentioned patent pending. How far along are you in that process? Jianfeng, do you want to take that? I have posted a link to our patent application if anyone, but uh, I think Jianfeng can walk you through where we are at. We're not hearing you, GM Peng, if you're speaking. It's uh, so secretive, they can't share it. <laughs> In the interest of transparency, though, I've literally put up the entire application link. So that is one thing we cannot be accused of. Um, what uh, I guess I, I, I can speak on his behalf then, which is that, uh, yeah, the 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 necessary patents have been applied for in the last uh, year or two. I believe we have uh, applied differently for uh, since they are uh, two different technologies. We've applied differently for the uh, copper release and the um, nanowire uh, electric field enhancement patents separately. Uh, oh, Jan Feng, I see you online. Uh, I, I see your image now. Do you want to try again by unmuting? Okay, looks like there's still some issue. Uh, but yeah, long story short, we have uh, applied for the patents. Uh, this is frankly our first time going through this process. So if anyone here has any suggestions on that, th that would be most welcome. Um, we expect just based on general statistics, probably another year or two for the patents to actually be approved. But as far as I know, the protection kicks in retroactively. So if we do decide to commercialize it, it's the application date that would count uh, when it comes to protecting the IP. 
Thank you. Uh, there's a follow-on question. It looks like for you all. Do you do you plan on any modifications to the prototype? To this current prototype, yes. So, like we said, we are working on all sorts of different things, um, as well as pilot scale next. But we do have some other prototypes in the lab. We have smaller bench scales that we've done different tests on. This is one of our larger ones. And uh, we've also built a longer one that's about two meters, right? Social distance size, six feet. Um, and so we, there's there's different things we want to test at bench scale, like different flow rates, higher flow rates, continuous flows, um, longer retention times, and how, how long the water can be in the pipes. And so in order to kind of bump our game up with that, we want to build larger systems, and that's where the pilot scale comes in next. But yes, we are still continuing to make make cute little prototypes as well. Awesome. Well, they don't have to be six feet now. CDC recommendation has reduced to three. So Right. So that's our next prototype. Yep. Great. Um, I just got a notification. The judges are finding their way back. I see Dr. Rosenstein just joined. I think while they're joining, we can share Robert Simon's comment. Great job, everyone. Impressive how much progress you've been able to make during such a challenging year. That's very, very true. Great job to all of the teams. Uh, on, on these amazing uh, inventions and presentations. Uh, very, very, very exciting. Let me see if everyone is back. So, yeah. Okay, so I think um, everybody's back. All the judges are back. So maybe the, um, the, the teams can again mute their, their video temporarily. Um, so thanks to, to the judges. Welcome back. Uh, we had a nice discussion while you, while you were gone. We just answered the last of the questions, so it was a good discussion. Um, before we announce the winners of this year's Entrepreneurial Impact Prize, I'd like to introduce my colleague, Dr. Adjo Amakudzi Kennedy, the Associate Chair for Global Engineering Leadership and Entrepreneurship, to tell us about our two generous donors who are sponsoring the prizes this evening. Uh, Adjo. Okay. Thank you, JT. A wonderful, wonderful event, excellent. Um, so this evening's competition and $5,000 prizes are made possible by Bill Higginbotham and Greg Zeitlin. So I'll start with the Higginbotham Prize first. Bill is a 1976 graduate of the School of Civil and Environmental Engineering and a serial entrepreneur. He has started over 13 businesses focused on geotechnical consulting, energy and environmental management, construction, and venture capital. Bill has been involved with the school through our external advisory board and as a professor of the practice, co-teaching the new innovation and entrepreneurship course. Thank you, Bill, for spearheading our entrepreneurial efforts within the school. So this year's Higgin Bottom Prize goes to, and I think uh, JT should be here with a drum roll for this, um, River Recon. Okay, Matthew Falcone, Erin Kowalski, um, Tim Timothy Purvis, and Kaylin Sinis Gali. Uh, please unmute your uh, videos and help me clap for the winning team. Okay, fantastic. All right, and so let's go to our next. Um, award. Um, and so uh, our second $5,000 prize was established by Greg Zeitlin. Honor of his parents, Phyllis Zeitlin and Alan G. G. Zeitlin. Alan Zeitlin was a 1962 graduate of the School of Civil and Environmental Engineering. He led a successful entrepreneurial career in construction and real estate in Atlanta. The Phyllis C. and Alan G. Zeitlin Prize honors Alan's appreciation of Georgia Tech for helping him first to launch his successful career, and secondly, uh, equally importantly, presenting the opportunity for him to meet his beloved wife, Phyllis. Many thanks to Greg Zeitlin for establishing this prize in his father's memory. So this year's Phyllis and Alan Zeitlin prize goes to Walter Pure, Nisim Gore Data, Mo Jaring, and thank you. Uh, please open up your uh, videos and, and help me to. Uh... Excellent. 
excellence. We also want to acknowledge BioBuilt and um, Culturia uh, for their wonderful efforts. So on that note, I'm going to go ahead and turn it over to our, our school chair, uh, Professor Don Webster. Great, thank you, Adjo. Uh, thank you to everyone for being here tonight for CE's first annual Entrepreneurial Impact Competition. Let's give a virtual round of applause to our winners and to all of our finalists for their innovative impact and interesting proposals. I'm inspired by what I saw here uh, this evening and I'm proud of the quality of work on display. Thank you to our judges for bringing your wealth of knowledge and experience to provide honest and constructive feedback to our students and for your thoughtful deliberations to select the winners for the Higginbotham and Zietland prizes. Thanks also to JT for emceeing the session and especially for his goofy jokes. You have set the bar high with this inaugural competition and I'm excited uh, for the entrepreneurial impact competitions in the years to come. Finally, to everyone who is watching at home, we hope you've enjoyed the competition and we appreciate your support for our students and for our school. Have a great night and a great weekend, everybody.